It's Wednesday, which can mean only one thing. It's time for the GCN Tech Clinic. Oh, and t but you're both of us this week. Yeah. What a treat. Two well, for the price of one. Yes, the Tech Clinic is where we aim to answer your bike, tech, and maintenance related questions. And as ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech. So without further ado, Alex, what's the first question we've first got? First question is from Slim Chakrun, who asks, Hi GCN, my bike fell down several times on the derailleur side, and I think either the derailleur cage or the derailleur hanger are bent, or maybe both. How can I get this to its normal form? Um, and he also says, they don't seem to sell derailleur hangers in his country. Right, well, I think, yes, this is almost certainly a bent yeah. uh, derailleur hanger and yeah. not the cage because that doesn't tend to happen. The cage tends to just snap with the pulley wheels and yeah. back damages. Yeah. But the um, derailleur hanger is designed to, to bend um, and it is a point of you know, built-in weakness to protect yeah. the derailleur. The bending of the hanger absorbs the forces from the impact, not your derailleur. It'd be like a crumple zone. You it could get it checked as well. There's um, specific tools for checking and aligning your derailleur hanger. Yes. So if it's only slightly out of alignment, some bike shops will have a tool which can put it into a line. But I'm always a little bit sceptical of doing this because I think once it's bent, you have sort of weakened it somewhat. Yes. So now, yeah, Alex is absolutely spot on. It's a simple job for a bike shop to rebend your derailleur hanger, or you can get the bending tool yourself, park make it. Um, but once I found that you've re-straightened them, it's like a temporary fix. Yeah. They tend to be a bit softer and bend a bit more easier, a bit more easily after that. So in terms of actually getting a replacement, they can be a little bit tricky to find. Mm. The best thing to do is to probably contact the manufacturer if you're struggling to find it, and they will be able to help you. But there are third-party uh, companies out yeah. there that do specialize in making derailleur hangers for like any bike. Um, I've seen them at the Taipei Bike Show. So do a bit of research, and I think you, if you do some digging, you should be able to find it. One piece of advice for everyone watching, even if you haven't bent your derailleur hanger, is go get a spare now. If you haven't got yeah. one, go get a spare. It's always useful having a spare derailleur hanger for your bike, just in a cupboard, ready to go if you need it. Because well, whenever one breaks, you have to look for it immediately, and you can't ride your bike. Yeah, next. and then you have, sometimes it can be two weeks before one turns up. Keep and, a backup. Definitely. Next question is from Dave Eastlick, who says, there are loads of tools to measure chain wear, but are there any tools or ways to measure the wear on the cassette or the cogs? Thanks. Mm. I don't think there are, not that I'm aware of. Lots of tools out there for the chain, but I've not seen any tools specifically designed to measure the wear on the cassette or the chain rings. My sort of, what everyone's sort of method of thinking tends to be, Keep an eye on the chain. When the chain's worn out, replace it. And if the chain's heavily worn, chances are the cassette's going to be the same. Yes, and you find that if you wash your, clean your cassette and chain, they last way, 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 way longer. But if you're, if you can look at a picture, perhaps of a brand new cassette uh, relative to yours, you will see that the ramps and the little pictures yeah. on the teeth become a lot more worn, and they become a bit more shark's toothy, yeah, you yeah don't uneven that. and sharp, um, in which case, yes, it's probably worth to replace your cassette. Um, next question is from Elki Westra, who says, what is the best combination of cranks and cassette for riding on the flat road only, like in the Netherlands? Well, oh. I would have said a standard chain set, so 39 tooth and a 53 tooth large chain ring. I think that would be the best option if it's pretty flat. Mm. That'll suit most people because you're not, well, you're not going to be going up any steep gradients, are you? So those gears should set you up about right. Yeah, I think then combined with a, well, the great thing with modern group sets now is you can easily combine that with an 1130 or an 1130 super yeah. set, which then gives you a huge range at the back as well. And you're not actually that far off uh, in terms of your easiest gear, what what a compact can give you. No. But no. you've just got that much more efficient, bigger chainring. I, I I would be inclined to go with the bigger chainring if I lived somewhere flat. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, next question is in from Jacob Richer, who asks, should I buy an aluminium bike with disc brakes or a carbon bike with rim brakes for the same price when the group sets are the same? It's yeah. a tricky one, isn't it? It's answer. It is. I mean, mm. this this is a... It would completely depend on your circumstances, your sort of, you know, riding and what you want to get out of the bike. Um, and everyone's going to be different in this regard. Both, you know, we've said it before, haven't we? Disc brakes, yeah. rim brakes, they both have advantages and disadvantages. And I think if you watch our video on 
you know, like why I got a rim oh, yeah. brake bike yeah. or like, you know, where we've discussed it in the past, you'll get an idea of those advantages and disadvantages and that will uh, probably answer your question better than we can. Disc brakes know. got consistency in all weather conditions. Yeah. Um, but obviously we're talking about the frames as well. So there's a lot to weigh up. You've got to sort of pinpoint what your preferences are and then choose from that. Mm. Hmm. Uh, next question. What have we got, Ollie? Sorry, we didn't really answer his question, but uh, yeah. Well, we sort of did. <laughs> um, Clay S says, I have hydraulic disc brakes on my road bike. What is the best method of braking on a very steep descent? Should I alternate front back every few seconds or use both? The goal is to not cook them. Both brakes, always both brakes. Yeah. It's obviously... Unless you want a skid for the kids, just like do yeah. cool skids, then just put your back one on. And you look super cool. And put all your weight over the front wheel and just oh, step God. out. Both brakes though, <laughs> although it is your front brake that does the majority of like slowing you down, isn't it? So you use them both together, there's a little bit more force through the front brake. But in terms of overheating the brakes, I think provided you're not going down the steepest gradient known to humanity, I Even think Even then, I think it's very difficult because yeah. Um, Shimano's engineers actually told me that when they were bringing out the latest version of their hydraulic disc brakes, in order to test them, they tried to destroy them. And one of the things they did was take them to the Mortarolo Pass in Italy, which is 12 kilometers at an average of about 14%, I think, or something, something daft. And they rode down that continually, and they kept weighting the rider and weighting the bike with additional weight so that it was, and they dragged the brakes the whole way um, in a bid to try and make them fail yeah. and um, they couldn't. So I think you're going to be all right, aren't you? Brakes yeah. will, they will generate heat and under sort of normal conditions. It's not something to be concerned about. If your brakes are a little bit warm, that's going to happen. It's friction. Yeah. I think you can get a little bit concerned with yeah. um, having to modulate your brakes. If you're on a really long descent, if you're dragging the brakes a lot because it's wet and you may be a bit scared or you're a heavier rider and you're on carbon clincher rims, then that can start to, you know, you can start to experience fade and worry about uh, cooking your brakes and delaminating carbon rims. Yeah. But with hydraulic disc brakes, you don't need to worry. One thing is, yeah, um, just put your weight, try and put your weight further back as well yeah, on the bike, because that'll help you stop quicker if you need to stop. Um, next question is from How, How Sherlock. Sher How Sherlock. Yeah. Uh, he says, I'm riding an aluminium rim brake wheel with Shimano Claris group set and flat pedals. I want to upgrade oh. um, step by step because of the small budget I have. So what should I upgrade first and last? Um, and you know, wheels and things like that, the group set, all the pedals. Do you know what I do first? Yeah. First thing, budget friendly, tires. Upgrade your tires first. That's probably one of the cheapest and most effective upgrades you can make. Yeah. Then I'd look to maybe doing the wheels. Um, somewhat more expensive than your tires, but another area that you can get some quite good improvements from. And I wouldn't necessarily upgrade the group set straight away because, well, certainly if you've got parts that are, have got plenty of life left in them, you might as well use them until they're worn out. And then when you go to replace them, then upgrade them. Mm. Mm. I think I, I would totally agree with that, oh, except good. the only thing I would drop in yeah. is before you do your wheels, yeah. he says it's on flats. So I would say oh. get some clipless pedals. Ah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good one as well. But I would do it in that in that order. But yes, absolutely, first upgrade you make, tyres, and potentially inner tubes as well, but definitely tyres. Next question is from Unparallel, who says, should you grease through axles or quick release levers? Yes. What would you grease them with? Um, bio grease, anything sort of greasy, really. You would want to use something a little bit thick. You wouldn't want to use like a thin oil because it would could just run out and you certainly don't want to go near your disc brakes, do you? Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, just grease the threads, grease the um, cam, the lever point, and it should work a lot better. There simple. you go. Quick, simple. Yeah. Arnie Schwarting um, says, I've just had a big crash on my bike. Oh, hope, you're, oh, yeah. hope you're all right, Arnie. Um, he said he hit the road at 60 kilometers an hour and he's currently recovering from a broken collarbone. My question is, what can I do, or what is the best way to look over my bike to see if it's still safe to ride after I recover? I've got a steel frame, um, but I have a carbon fork with a carbon steerer and carbon wheels. First glance, the bike looks fine, um, as it just basically fell to the ground and I ended up flying through the air while, um, like Wiley e. Coyote. Okay. <laughs> God. Right. Well, I would say if you've got a carbon fork, take your fork out, yeah. undo your headset, pull the fork out, visually inspect it. 
Yeah. If there's something bad, like a you know a crack in the steerer, you'll be, you able, be able to see, see it. I yeah. would say. Um, Same for the frame as well. You can check that over visually. Something that I find is quite good is even when you're cleaning your bike, even if you just take a cloth and wipe it over all the parts, any sort of chips or damaged paintwork or even the material, the cloth will often snag on it. So then mm. it sort of highlights it for you as well. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, classic thing is a bar strike on the top tube. Oh, yeah. So uh, when you've crashed, the bars swing round violently and the handlebar strikes the top tube. So to find this point is easy on your bike. You can move the handlebars around until they touch the top tube and that's the point it would impact. I check that area on both sides of the top tube. Um, and the other thing with a steel frame is it's unlikely to snap like a carbon yeah. frame. And dented and stuff. Yeah, yeah but it could, um, it could bend and become warped. Um, this is an easy thing to check as well. Simply get your tape measure out and um, measure from um, the top of the head tube down to the rear dropout on either side. And it should be the same distance. If there's a discrepancy in that distance, then, um, well, yeah. You've got an issue, uh, haven't you? You can have an issue. Yeah. Also, if you're not sort of particularly mechanical minded or you want the super easy option, you could just drop your bike to a local bike shop, get them to give it a once over, and that'll give you sort of peace of mind. And yes. for added peace of mind, you can even get some components x rayed. So your carbon forks, you get an x rayed. Yes. And there are specialists out there for that. Yeah, and bike, uh, bike shops often do specialise in this and do this because it's often used as part of insurance claims too. So, yeah, good advice. Perfect. Next up, who have we got? Mike Eckert, mm. who says, uh, if I know I won't cross-chain, could I ride too short a chain? Oh, I don't want to see this. Yeah? No, I don't want to see it. So I presume- Save what... some weight though. You save like yeah. 10 grams, cut a few links out. So yeah, I presume what he's saying <laughs> is, if he's not going to use the large chain ring on the top of the cassette, he could make his chain a bit shorter. Mm. Um, I don't know why. Why would you want to do that? Maybe for help chain retention, a bit of added tension on the um, on the cage on the mech, trying to keep it a bit tighter. Mm. But I just think you're you're running a bit of a risky game doing that because if you accidentally miss shift or something, you could potentially rip your rear derailleur off. You, yeah. you do not want that mid ride, do you? Yeah, and sometimes you don't always shift, unless you locked it off with. Uh, you know, you could lock it off so that you couldn't use With the limit screws or yeah, something. Yeah, on the limit screws or DI2, you could program it yeah. so that it can't Even then, I'd still be a bit mindful because if you change the correct length, it, you know, someone's engineer has been paid a lot of money to design these systems. Mm. I'm pretty sure they'd have got it right. But if you're adding more tension onto the chain, you're potentially throwing away some watts. Yes, mm. the, I've heard this that yeah. the drivetrain efficiency is designed for the particular track, uh, chain length. Yeah. However, I've not seen any data on this. No. So no, it's something I that I think we should endeavour to investigate. The theory's in the there, isn't it? Yes. Mm. So we would say no, use the correct length chain, but we're also going to try and investigate in the future. So that's all we've got time for this week, but thanks for your questions. It's always a pleasure answering them. And sorry if we didn't get around to answering your question. If that is the case, then just well, feel free to submit it again under this video and we'll do our best to answer it in a future edition of the Tech Clinic. That's it, I guess we'll see you next week. All right, bye. See ya.